Okay, welcome back. Here we are entering our fourth lecture here in chapter 20. Uh, and believe it or not, we're still going to focus on those enzymes. We're getting to the vitamins. Uh, hold off. Uh, don't forget about the vitamins. We will talk about them, but uh, we're still going to be enzyme focused for this lecture. Up until now, we've talked about the generic uh, enzymes, what they are, uh, what they tend to be made from, and all those good things. We looked at uh, the um, nomenclature and the factors affecting enzyme function. And here we are now ready to discuss enzyme inhibition in this fourth lecture. All right, so enzyme inhibitors. Uh, inhibitors themselves are molecules that cause a loss of catalytic activity. Uh, and they do so here in enzymes by preventing substrates from fitting into the active sites. Uh, this sounds bad, but uh, of course, enzymes being able to catalyze uh, reactions over and over and over again do sometimes need to be put on hold. And so inhibitors uh, can be positive or negative uh, uh, in terms of what they do uh, in the human body. If we want to talk about uh, specific types of inhibitors, reversible inhibitors are inhibitors that cause a loss of enzymatic activity that can be reversed. Uh, so uh, that sounds good, right? Ordinarily, we do want to be able to reverse things. Uh, and um, they can act in different ways, but uh, they do not form covalent bonds with the enzymes because that's more difficult to reverse. So uh, we wouldn't expect to see covalent bond formation, but we uh, could expect the reversible inhibitors to somehow prevent those substrates from fitting into the active sites by doing something else to that enzyme. Uh, looking at another type of inhibitor, we have competitive inhibitors. So a competitive inhibitor has a chemical structure and polarity that is similar to that of the substrate. So therefore, it competes with the substrate for the active site. Uh, and you can uh, have the effect reversed by increasing substrate concentration. So there we see the enzyme active site. Uh, this is the induced fit model, right, where we take that enzyme active site that doesn't look quite right for that substrate, but as they come together, they, they uh, both uh, have uh, modifications to their conformations, uh, and uh, then they go on to be uh, effectively making the products and uh, being able to work again. Well, if we have uh, something like I there that fits that original active site quite well, uh, but doesn't release, uh, we can uh, find ourselves in trouble there. Uh, the uh, solution is to increase the amount of substrate and it will outcompete that I if we have more S around. And you can think about things like carbon monoxide poisoning. Carbon monoxide does very well at binding to hemoglobin much better than oxygen. Uh, so it's a very deadly gas, uh, but if you happen to uh, get to the patient in time and you can saturate uh, the atmosphere with oxygen, uh, you can um, competitively reverse that by increasing the oxygen, the, the desired substrate concentration uh, by quite a bit. If we look at anti-metabolites, there's another example of competitive inhibitors in medicine. So we have bacterial infections sometimes treated with competitive inhibitors called anti-metabolites. Uh, for instance, sulfonylamide uh, competes with paraminobenzoic acid, PABA or PABA there, uh, an essential metabolite in the growth cycle of bacteria. So uh, first we show succinate, which is the desired substrate, and then malinate, which is uh, an inhibitor that differs just by one uh, CH2 group. Uh, and if we look at uh, now our example, the substrate paraminobenzoic acid, PABA, uh, and its inhibitor, sulfonylamide, uh, very similar structures. Again, not quite the same, but similar enough that both fit the active site of the enzyme and the inhibitor, uh, if you can have concentrations high enough, uh, will prevent the substrate from binding sufficiently to prolong the life of these bacteria in the case of sulfonylamide over PABA. The competitive inhibitors that we just discussed probably make a lot of sense. They have a similar shape to the desired substrate, but since they can't form the products, you can't release uh, at that final stage, so you tie up the enzyme. Uh, in the case of non-competitive inhibitors, uh, you have a structure that's much different than the substrate, and it doesn't compete for the active site. So we're not going after the active site like a competitive inhibitor. Instead, you're binding at some other site, what we call an allosteric site, another site that distorts the shape of the enzymes so the binding can no longer happen at the active site, 
uh, because that non competitive inhibitor binding at an allosteric site changes the shape of the active site so it doesn't fit the desired substrate anymore. Um, a consequence of this uh, non competitive inhibitor binding at an allosteric site is you can't have its reverse affected. Uh, I'm sorry, you can't have its effect reversed, I should say, by adding more substrate because it's not competing for the substrate's active site. It's binding somewhere else on the enzyme and causing a change to the active site. So uh, these are much more dangerous uh, compared with the uh, competitive inhibitors because you can't just try to uh, increase the substrate concentration and overcome the uh, inhibitor effect. So here we see a cartoon of the non-competitive inhibitor. So we have our active site uh, for, of the enzyme and our substrate. Uh, and again, this is an induced fit model. Uh, so we see the uh, circular substrate uh, coming and uh, joining to that active site in such a way that both active site and substrate change conformation to accommodate each other in the enzyme substrate complex. Then finally, you get the enzyme product complex. Uh, release the product, the enzyme active site goes back to its original shape uh, until it finds another uh, substrate molecule to uh, act on to, for both to change their shapes to the desired uh, activity size shape. If on the other hand we look down uh, and we have our active site uh, with uh, the substrate there ready to come and approach it, but we have a non-competitive inhibitor also, the non-competitive inhibitor binds along the bottom away from the active site, but when it does bind, it causes the active site itself to change dramatically so that um, a circular substrate that sort of induced a fit into that um, uh, I don't know, bottom of a hexagon type active site that we originally have, now it's got no chance to uh, cause that induced fit with this new active site that the competitive inhibitor has caused the enzyme to refold and create. So we can't um, change uh, that uh, shape just by adding more substrate because the substrate can't go in there anymore. So non-competitive inhibitors, you cannot flood those with additional substrate and expect any sort of result because you've got to somehow remove that inhibitor and get the enzyme active site back to normal before you could have any hope of substrate being able to be acted on by that enzyme. Now, if we're looking at irreversible inhibition, we have an inhibitor that has covalently bonded with the R groups of an amino acid that may be near the active site, and that's going to change the shape of the enzyme, which will prevent the substrate from being able to enter the active site, whether it's a lock and fit, a lock and key type fit, or a an induced fit model. Uh, either way, you're not going to be able to get the substrate to enter the active site because the um, irreversible inhibitor has covalently bound to an R group near that active site and now it no longer allows for the uh, desired substrate to be acted upon. So it destroys enzyme activity altogether uh, and this uh, is obviously not a good thing for uh, reactions that require enzymes in order to function. And here in table 20.6 we see some examples of these irreversible enzyme inhibitors. Uh, fairly nasty things for the most part, at least uh, the ones that act on uh, human enzymes. So cyanide uh, in particular, there's its structure, it's uh, CN minus. Uh, hopefully you remember your uh, Lewis structures from back in uh, GOB1. Uh, it has the uh, smell of bitter almonds. Uh, you find it in things like cherry pits and it does occur in nature, but oftentimes it would be uh, an intentional poisoning that would result in uh, cyanide uh, being uh, present in sufficient amounts to act as an irreversible enzyme inhibitor in the body. Uh, and the way it inhibits is by bonding to metal ions and enzymes involved in electron transport, those uh, oxidoreductases that we talked about um, in our previous lecture. Uh, that's uh, going to be a problem if you can't uh, cause oxidation or reduction reactions that uh, enzyme catalysts uh, help uh, to occur in the body, um, you're, you're not going to live very long, and that's why cyanide poisoning is so dangerous. If we look at the next example, sarin, uh, which is a nerve gas, inhibits cholinesterase from breaking down acetylcholine, and that results in continual nerve transmission and uh, overstimulation there that's uh, not desirable, to say the least. Uh, then we have parathion, uh, there it's an insecticide, uh, and uh, it does that same sort of thing for insects, uh, fortunately not on humans. Uh, 
uh, and then finally penicillin, uh, which was our first uh, in the arsenal against uh, the uh, bacteria. Um, it's from the penicillin uh, fungus, and uh, it inhibits enzymes that build cell walls in bacteria. So good for us as uh, humans with animal cells that don't have cell walls. We get no uh, impact from this uh, irreversible enzyme inhibitor, while the bacteria that rely on cell walls uh, will no longer be able to create those cell walls and uh, they uh, die off as a result. So there we see uh, penicillin itself as well as uh, the G and V variant, ampicillin, amoxicillin, um, probably things that uh, many of us have been on at some point in our lives, thanks to uh, the uh, pioneering work of uh, Sir Alexander Fleming and others uh, working on those early antibiotics. Believe it or not, we're already at the end of this fourth lecture on uh, chapter 20, so it's time for our learning check. In this particular learning check, you're asked to identify each description of an inhibitor that is either one competitive or two non-competitive. So for A, B, C, D, decide whether uh, it's a one, a competitive inhibitor, or two, a non-competitive inhibitor. Uh, make your assignments, Just pause the video here if you need a moment to do that. And uh, when you're ready to check your work, uh, please start us back up. Good luck. Okay, so hopefully you arrived at this very nice 1 2 1 2 pattern, right? So for A, increasing substrate reverses inhibition. That's definitely a competitive inhibitor because they're fighting for that same active site. And if you can flood out the inhibitor by having more substrate, uh, then you can reverse that inhibition. For B, it binds to the enzyme surface but not to the active site. That's going to be two, a non-competitive inhibitor because it's not competing for the active site. Uh, it's binding elsewhere and affecting the active site. For C, its structure is similar to the substrate. That's going to be your competitive inhibitor. That's why they're uh, after that same active site because they're very structurally similar. And then D, inhibition is not reversed by adding more substrate. Uh, well, uh, again, if in A, increasing substrate reverses inhibition, if that described a competitive inhibitor, then when inhibition is not reversed by adding more substrate, we must be talking about two, a non-competitive inhibitor. So hopefully uh, you were able to get that uh, nice pattern of one, two, one, two. Uh, if that's not the case, hopefully now you understand why those are the best choices for those descriptions. Uh, if not, if you're still struggling with these concepts and it's just not making sense, please do reach out to me for some help. Otherwise, we'll meet again in the next uh, lecture on Chapter 20.